Welcome to Boston, a city most definitely built on the sea. The cruise ship is based at Black Orphan Dock, which is here, and the shuttle bus will take you to here, to Quincy Market. Just up from the wharf is the Black Rose Pub. It's an Irish pub, and just behind that is the marketplace, where apparently all the fun happens, morning and evening, according to the locals. Quince's is mainly a cheap place to eat takeaway food, and it's good. They built a pub called Cheers near Quince's to capitalise on the name, but the real place is in Deacon Hill and we'll take you there later. Just outside Quince's is Fenoil Hall, which is a visitor centre and retail shops. And we're going to pick up the Freedom Trail here. In the 18th century, Boston's Patriots led the American colonies in defence of their threatened liberty, protesting against unjust treatment by the British Crown. There's a talk here daily at 3.30, and today it's a ranger talking about the Native Americans in Massachusetts. A local guide will tell you so much more, but if you want to do it alone, how do you follow the Freedom Trail? Look down. Inside this building is actually the state blue line tube and it's a beautiful building. The old state meeting house is a meeting house and in 1876 the Bostonians fought to save this building from the wrecking ball. We're in the Italian part of Boston. It's a wash with little tutorials, still on the Freedom Trail. One bar we saw had Tom Cruise and Robert De Niro's picture in the window and we're looking for Paul Revere's house. In the Italian area, just down the bottom of Prince's Street, is the Sacred Heart Church. We're getting closer. The Bethel in North Square, the most historic square in Boston, was founded in 1828 for the moral and religious instruction of seamen, and it was remodelled as the Sacred Heart. And this is Paul Revere's house where he lived with his wife, Rachel. Paul Revere was an American silversmith and engraver, one of the founding fathers. He's credited with organising and creating the alarm system that told when the British were coming. You'll hear stories of him riding out and coming back to give a warning. But there was probably a lot more to it than that. And here's the man himself, Paul Revere. He rode out and told everyone that the British were coming. This little house was built in 1712 and it managed to survive when all its neighbours' houses were torn down, even Benjamin Franklin's house next door. You don't want your cutters to get your recipe, and that's the customer. So right now you can make chocolate like that easily. Yeah, easily. Uh, Bitter by our carrot. Um, so I scrape it off. Again, pop it into my mold down there. Once I had enough, pop, pop in there. And then you have a little uh, demi tasse bowl of chocolate, and then we have just eight spices. So it's uh, vanilla, cinnamon, mm -hmm. nutmeg, chili pepper, orange zest, anise, anato, and salt. Wow. So we are used to having about a cup of sugar a day versus their uh, cup of sugar for every four months and that's if they could afford sugar at all. Recreating the era of the Revolutionary War when people drank hot chocolate and, and found their news by printing. So we are printing today treason and sedition in the form of the Declaration of Independence. They could get in trouble for this for sure. Here are your letters uh, in each little case. The letters you won't need as much, like your capital letters, will be up there, for instance, in your upper case. Your other letters will be down here in your lower case. All right. This is wool with leather on top, hammered all the way around. And our ink formula is an 18th century formula. It is carbon black. Rinseed oil, which is like flaxseed oil boiled, and then pine resin, which is very good to stick the sound. Once this was all laid out, that was the hard part. Then you could do a sheet every 15 seconds, one person inking, one person pushing through. Yeah, so here we go. Turn this down. This is a double press. We're going to press twice. I'm going to pull this, it's going to push the plotting down, the ink is going to set in the paper. And here we go. Wow. 
Wow. Anyways, I'll take it out. I'll hold it up. The general content doesn't change, but some changes here and there. And we're the only ones to reprint the Boston edition since the 1700s. We sell these for just $17.76. So to find this little gem, you go down Hanover Street, cut through the park to Unity Street, and it's Clough House. You walk towards North Church, and they work off donations. It's well worth a visit. This is the beautiful Boston Common, and we're searching for the Cheers Bar. We're walking through to the top of the Common, and we're going to pass the Boston, Massachusetts State House, which is that building there. Sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name. I guess Boston will have to go on our movie location section. Come in. The Boston bar that inspired the TV series Cheers was originally known as the Bull and Finch Pub and was established in 1969. They really used the exterior and the idea of the pub. It's taken the name Cheers now. You go downstairs into the basement level, below street level to get in, and you go upstairs to the bar, which looks more like the one that you'll see in the TV show. If you do go to the Cheers bar, just behind it is an area of old historic houses. It's great for a stroll around. Let's take a look around Long Wharf. Just a generation ago, this whole bay was a complete mess. If you fancy sailing on a clipper, they have tall ships here. The Wharf Project began in 1984 to protect public access from the ever-developing waterfront. It now stretches an amazing 43 miles. Do you have your walking shoes on? This is the start of Boston's Harbour Walk. Where possible, the pathway is 12 foot wide and links public amenities such as parks and restaurants and, very importantly, bathrooms. There is also a water transportation infrastructure. Not that. So, if you're dropped at Quince's by your cruise shuttle, the wharf is right there. The Harbour Walk is full of sea grills and nice cafes and on a pleasant evening, what better place could you come? There are endless sea tours available, pirates, whale watching, and you can find them listed on our Doris Visits tour selection pages on our website. But now, we're looking for the Boston Tea Party Museum, and I think it's over there. The British Prime Minister, George Greenville, believed that the colonists, because they had benefited so much from the war, should help pay for the 10,000 troops that were still in America. So he put a tax on sugar. The Americans objected to this. Samuel Adams said, if taxes are laid on us in any shape without us having legal representation, are we not reduced from the character of subjects to the miserable state of tributary slaves? This is the Boston Tea Party Museum. It's $28 to go in, so it's quite a lot. They do theme evenings here with actors in historical costumes. The Sugar Act didn't generate enough money, so the government passed the Stamp Act, which affected paper. This was met with a storm of protest. Then they taxed paint, glass, lead and tea. Hostility grew rapidly. British soldiers fired into a crowd of unarmed civilians and this fueled the outrage of the people of Boston and this event became known as the Boston Massacre. We finished up our day in Boston with a bite to eat at Joe's which is right on the waterfront, really good value and delicious food. We've arrived at Troy, it's about five minutes away from the museum in the coach. The important positioning of the land of Troy meant that it was occupied for over 3,000 years. So there was Troy 1, Troy 2, right up to Troy 9, and they're all standing on top of each other. No one knows what they were actually called, but archaeologists have labelled them that. Oh, that's killing heat here in, you know, real summer. 